Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New York jazz guitarist and composer Matt Pinatus. We talked about his latest 2021 CD, Field Theory, his life in jazz, this COVID-19 world we are surviving through, and so much more. He grew up in Springfield, Ohio, and Indianapolis, Indiana. He played the piano when he was young, but he switched to guitar because he was inspired by Jimmy Page and Jimi Hendrix. Over the years, his distinctive playing has led to performances throughout New York City and all over the world. Dig his story. Thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. I, I really appreciate your interest in my project. Yeah, so Field Theory. Before we get into the actual construction and the artistic vision that you had for this project, I want to know from you, you know, it's coming out during a pandemic. And, I, you know, when I started doing these interviews around this time last year, it was like, all right, you got an album. You can't back anything up live. But, of course, that's all anybody knew was to back up their, their performances live. Now a year into, the, into this, all we know is being dormant. We don't know what that's like anymore. So is this album coming out now? Do you have any ambiguity about this? Do you see this as maybe a live performance, you know, a pretty big yeah. thing to happen? What's your thoughts on this? I'm not exactly sure how it's going to take shape. I mean, I, I wasn't in a huge rush. I felt really lucky that we got into the studio right before everything shut down. You know, so, so we recorded this just about a year ago. So, so it was live, but in terms of how we're going to present it now that it's, now that it's going to come out into the world, I'm not sure. I, I'm really hoping to do some live concerts. Um, I really want to play this stuff live in front of audiences, of course. Um, but we might do like a live stream show, you know, maybe a live stream uh, CD release show, something like that. Talk yeah. to me about the project. That, ultimately, with, with what, what you produce, what do you want mm -hmm. the listener to get from this experience? What do you ultimately want them to take away from this that you've put out for them? Well, you know, I think what my music is seeking to do is sort of create a sonic environment for the listener. I think each listener is going to take something different away from the experience, you know, depending on where they're coming from. You know, some, some people might, you know, musicians might, might lock on the one one aspect of the music whereas a non-musician might might be transported into some sort of different place you know so so my music is really trying to trying to sort of create a, a an environment and like a almost like a portal into another place so that musicians and listener can experience something together yeah does that make sense yeah it totally makes sense you know the one thing mm -hmm. about this pandemic you know, I moved to Lee Summit, Missouri, the home of Papatini, right before the shutdown began. And I find it interesting anytime I bring that up, um, yeah. especially with guitar players, there's, I, 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 I could probably write a book on the amount of things that I hear about Papatini, either stories, experiences, influences. Do you have any, was Papatini an influence on how you got to the guitar? Not at first, you know. I, I, I would say that... Uh, Although there was the the album Bright Size Life, you know, that, that trio album that he made with Jocko, I, I did come across that fairly early on, and that influenced me a lot. You know, that really blew me away. Yeah. Uh, but but in, in a way, I, I think like some of my early experiences of getting into jazz, you know, were kind of coming out of rock and then finding some guys like John Coltrane, you know, finding yeah. Coltrane and, and, and hearing like Miles Davis and just, just like being blown away from their music and in a way trying to sort of play that stuff on the guitar. Well, you have Midwestern roots. You, you're from, um, you grew up in Springfield, Ohio, and in Indianapolis, Indiana. So talk to me a little bit about how these Midwestern roots grew into a jazz career. I, I was lucky to, 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 you know, I got into, I've always been interested in music. You know, I was exposed to music at a young age. You know, luckily I came across jazz. I had a great band program at my school. And I was at public school, and, and I was exposed to uh, the, the big band jazz program. And through my, some of the directors there, I, I learned a lot. I kind of got exposed to jazz and started studying. You know, one of my, one of my early experiences, I, I went down to a camp in Louisville, maybe sort of like the Jamie Abersall camps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I went to, uh, yeah, so I, you know, I went to a, a, one of those camps. It was like, really exposed to a lot of jazz and then I came back and let's see I mean I guess I just 
I just got so deeply into it, and uh, it, it, it brought me out to New York. Right on. I'm always amazed at how those Jamie Abersall camps and even, like, Jazzmobile has, like, really brought a lot of people to jazz. It's like I always used to look at those old ads for cigarettes and how they wanted to hook the kids in, and I always think about the Jazzmobile and those camps as, like, cigarettes for kids. Because once, once it gets a <laughs> hold on you, you're a fan, man. Like, jazz is the yeah. way that you go. So... Um, yeah, what a yeah, good, exactly. what a what a good force in the world. What was the first live jazz show that you saw, like witnessed with your own eyes, and thought, "That's what I want to do." One of my early early trips out to New York. So I was probably in high school. I, I came out to New York, and I I went to this now now extinct club, uh, Sweet Basil's, and I heard Steve Torre, you know, the trombone player, and he was yeah. and he was playing with with Reggie Workman. And I, I was I was just totally floored. I mean, I was of course into jazz at, at, at this point, and had heard some like local musicians in Indianapolis. But hearing that that music just and I, I wasn't even sure exactly who those guys were, but just the sound and the, the and the energy and and the vibe that that they created, like I just knew it was something that I had to be a part of. You know, it's funny every time I hear stories like this, especially with people that see it in New York. I can't remember this cat's name, but he was telling me a story about how all his life he wanted to go to New York and see a show, and he got to the Vanguard, and he he saw the show, and at intermission, he came up, and he stood on the sidewalk, and he looked around, and he totally fainted. He fell like a sack of pigs <laughs> to the ground. And, you know, I'm from Kansas City, and I see shows, and I've been around a little bit, but since I've really had this show since 2010, I haven't been to a mm-hmm. mecca like that. And I think that's probably going to happen to me. I'm going to go down. I'm going to feel like I'm getting asphyxiated. I'm going to come walking up, and I'm just going to drop to the earth, and that's going to be the end of it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So let me ask you this. You know, you've been on stage with some big names in jazz, and you've been around the block. What have you learned from, like, the legends, luminaries, and veterans that have in turn helped you teach younger cats that you get on stage with? Wow, that's a good question. You know, to, to be honest, like a lot of the lessons that I think I've learned from playing with with the musicians that are, that, that come before me and that are more experienced than me, it's it's a little bit difficult to put into words. You know, there's a lot that has to do with with time feel and and expression and the ways that they hold themselves and the ways that they perform. You know that that, that I try to I try to to imitate or to 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 emulate, and I think that really informs what I'm trying to do musically. You know, there's a there's sort of an intangible essence to it. One of my mentors uh, is Rodney Jones, and he used to say, you know, when it comes to rhythm, it's something that's caught and not necessarily taught. And you know, I, I feel it's like you're kind of like catching this this essence of the music from playing with these people, and it's it's something that I feel is passed down. You know from one generation to the next. So, so you know, I feel lucky to have, to have touched it a little bit, and so if, if in some way I'm able to pass that along to younger musicians, I do the best that I can, you know. I think about that with Ralph Peterson. I had an interview with him in 2019, and, you know, with him mm. just passing, the vigor yeah. he had for, for, like, really igniting that flame and passing it on and carrying the torch was so, so evident. And... um yeah, so I think that's very yeah. important um, in, in the craft. What What's the best thing about waking up every day, knowing you're a musician and you get to create something? What do you look forward to the most? Well, actually, I really, I really uh, appreciate being able to craft my day the way that I that I like. You know, to have times of of creativity and then times of work. Maybe these days is a little more common, right? We're all kind of going through this. You know, we're we have different sorts of work schedules. But I, I enjoy waking up and, and, and knowing that I'm going to have some time to be creative, some, some time to, like, make something, try to build something. You know, I, I look forward to practicing, you know, of course, but just the, the, there's a lot of life that is part of every day, right, that we're, we're, we're all doing. So there's moments of, of work. But, but it's, the, it's the spaces in between when I can, when I can perf- you know, be creative and, and work on, on my craft that I, I look forward to each day. What do you miss the most from that old world of, you know, pre-March 12, 2020? What is it that you want to get back to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, I really want to get back to playing with people, playing with musicians, um, getting together, um, maybe going to jam sessions, maybe going to hear a gig. But I, I like to get together with musicians, and, and, and even that has been, has been tricky to do during these times. Um, I, got, I got lucky during the summer. I had an opportunity to do a lot of playing outdoors, which was, which was great, you know. So at least we had a little bit of, a little bit of uh, an opportunity to, to perform and play. But yeah, I just, I just miss getting together with people and, and playing for people, you know, like having an audience there, having people listening, interacting, just, just being with other people. Taking that a step further when we do return, and that's becoming mm-hmm. more and more eminent now, what do you hope both musician and the audience realizes about this long time away from live music? You know, I, I hope that, uh, I think that people are going to realize how precious it is, you know, to be able to go out and, and hear live music and to experience that in person, you know, to, be, to, to experience that with other people. Uh, to experience a, a, a place, a location together, you know, and, and this moment in time. I think um, that, that's a really precious thing. And I, I just hope that all, all the clubs are, are still there when we get to the other side of this. We can all get together and celebrate. It's a hard time for a lot of people. Yeah, it is. If you could get into a jazz DeLorean and go anywhere in time and see a show, um, anywhere in time, and then hang out and talk after the show. Who are you going to go see? Who do you want to talk to? <laughs> oh, man, so many. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> how, how about 1964 and, and, and Miles Davis, you know, right, right after that four and more concert? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you're, you're preaching to the choir. My son, who's 16, his name is Miles for obvious reasons, so I, I dig it. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect yeah i've always thought it would be i mean i think there's a lot of people that are intimidated by miles but i i would really uh-huh. really like to talk to him because i think i did actually talk to dick conti one time and he had some really great miles davis stories like he was telling me one time that miles called him and had some of that real avant stuff he was working on i think in the 70s you know just uh-huh. real far out stuff and back in the day you just put it on cassette tapes and he gave it to him <laughs> and said, you know, here, play it overnight. I mean, it was a real rush thing. And he had, I think he went to his house and picked it up in a bag and took it to the studio there oh, wow. in Frisco and played it and then took it back. I guess he left it on the wrong doorstep. So Miles <laughs> called up and basically was like, dude, I got guns. <laughs> and Dick was like, oh, my God, dude. And, and so I guess they figured out he put it on the wrong doorstep. But he realized that Miles wasn't playing. When you heard these stories, about him getting gone yeah. real fast, like that was that was not something that was made up. <laughs> so yeah, uh, he was serious. Yeah, he was like, dude, this is you know, I I, I have a direct line to God right now. You could be there real quick. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so let me ask you this: Everything's going to come down to this. Everyone has a perception or an interpretation of who they think you are. Your family, your friends, your fans. But you're the one that wakes up every day and lives your life. Who do you think you are? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a deep question, man. I believe that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a creative being walking in this world. You know, as, as, as a musician, it's my, it's my job to try, to try to tap into, you know, this, this different place and, and sort of be like a conduit to that, to that space for other people. You know, I, I I think it's important to try to try to understand what what this world is that we're living in and that, and this existence that we have. To this 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 day to day struggle, you know, it's it, it's my goal to sort of capture that and 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 express my personal experience with that reality, and hopefully, you know, that will open up something for someone else. So that they can, they can have a perception of, of what's really going on. Matt, Perhaps that's a bit esoteric, but uh... <laughs> no, no, it's good, man. No, that's great. There's there is so many ways to answer that question, and uh, that's great, man. Thank you for taking a minute out to talk about field theory, your life and music, and good luck with everything. 
Hey, absolutely. Thanks so much for for your interest. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Ohio, Indiana, New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Matt for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Storm. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.